Hi there, folks, and welcome to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again. Great to have you with us today. Thank you for tuning in. And thank you once again for your super positive reviews of our show on the iTunes Store. Truly appreciate that. And for those of you who haven't yet, thank you also for pausing this recording and going to post a review right now. Yes, much appreciated. Okay, so here's another one that I'm going to read out loud for you, uh, just because I like it so much. This one's from Marcus in the UK. And Marcus says, I've been reading about and looking into Japanese real estate for a while now. Even though I'm an avid podcast listener, I never imagined there would be a podcast concerning this topic, but that's what the Japan Real Estate Podcast is all about. It's presented in a friendly but professional way, explaining all aspects very clearly from property search to making an offer, from closing the deal to managing a rental property. There are interviews with experts and real people, ones who are experienced as well as ones who are just starting out in real estate investment in Japan. Highly recommended. Uh, wow, thank you for that, Marcus. That is well and truly appreciated. And you've hit the nail right on the head there. This is exactly what we're trying to do with the podcast, is to present, present uh, practical, tactical, useful information uh, with very little sales speeches, we hope, and helping people learn from both our experience and that of our customers, and of course, also from industry professionals and experts. So I'm really glad to hear that's been your impression. And thank you again for this wonderful review. And also, before we dive in, just on the topic of sponsorship, which, as I've mentioned in our last episode, will soon be available, uh, we've been contacted by a few of you who are wondering just how expensive the advertising on the show is going to be. Uh, well, not expensive at all is the answer. We're going to be charging something like $20 or $30 per month, and depending on the spot and whether it's just a mention by uh, yours truly or an actual short pre-prepared segment, which could include anything you want to put into it, so a jingle, voiceover. Um, anything at all, as long as it's professional and as long as we approve the product or service or project that you want to uh, advertise. And again, your promotion will be listened to at least 15,000 times a year, over 1,000 full episode downloads or streams per month. And these are all by people who are either living in Japan or have a strong interest in the country, um, all of them English speakers and all of them with comfortable salaries or income. So well worth those uh, 20, 30 bucks a month. Don't be shy. Reach out and tell us what you'd like us to help you market to our listeners. And we'll be more than happy to help you increase your reach. Okay, so for today's topic, one of our YouTube listeners mentioned that they'd really like to hear an update on the JREIT, the Japanese Real Estate Investment Trust market. Uh, we've done an episode explaining this sector a little bit a couple of years back, and that was downloaded many, many times. So we know the topic does interest many of you. And we agreed that it would be a good idea to see how they've been faring generally, but also in light of the COVID pandemic. So here goes. Now, the info here all comes from a variety of sources. The most prominent one uh, being Seville's Property Research and Consultancy and also S&P Standard & Poor's, uh, who are a global financial, financial rating agency, and japan-reit.com. And that one is the best source out there for anyone who's actually active in the market and wants to track individual JREITs, their performance, press releases, um, recent acquisitions and news and so forth. Really good website that provides all the data you'll need to familiarize yourself with before deciding on how to actually construct your JREIT portfolio. Highly recommended website. We'll link to it as well as to our first episode on this topic and to an article that I wrote on the subject a couple of years back uh, in this episode show notes. So go check it all out. But to anyone unfamiliar with the topic, REITs are publicly traded companies that specialize in purchasing real estate under a fund structure, and they pay dividends to investors based on the fund's performance, uh, but also, of course, provide their real value by being publicly traded, enabling investors who own their shares to potentially profit from the trades, uh, when they do well, of course, and Japanese REITs have generally been doing well. The only downside to them in comparison with REITs in other countries is that they tend to be a bit pricier meaning the cost of a single stock unit uh, tends to be higher than others in other countries. And that, of course, means a bit less diversification. Um, they do, however, come in all shapes and forms. So many of them are diverse in their own right, meaning some JREITs will focus on a single sector like residential logistics uh, or, say, hospitality properties. But others are more diverse and they invest in different profile properties, various locations, socioeconomic tenant profiles, and so forth. So you can definitely diversify and hedge even just within the JREIT portion of your investment portfolio. You can even diversify to uh, alternative asset classes like shared offices, uh, elderly care, and so forth. And the advantages, of course, as opposed to direct property ownership is that uh, REITs are far more liquid and affordable. So you can spend just a few thousand bucks on a few stocks, sell them off with a click, 
as opposed to a minimum of, say, twenty, thirty thousand dollars for direct property ownership in Japan, uh, which is not expensive, but still a lot more. And to liquidate the property, of course, you will need at least a few months. Um, so that's nothing, nothing at all like actually owning and selling stocks. So how are Japan's uh, REITs doing? Well, we should probably separate their performance into pre- and post-COVID outlooks, as we would do for most asset classes these days. Up until 20 February 2020, that's a nice date, isn't it? It's all twos and zeros. So up until 20 February this year, they were doing phenomenally well. At that point, the Tokyo Stock Exchange REIT uh, peaked at over 2,250 points, net asset value of 1.28, which is the total value of the assets minus their liabilities. So they were all performing well. And an average dividend of 3.5%. Now, mind you, these are all averages. If you actually dive into the data, some sectors, of course, do better than others, depending on economic climate. And it's also important to understand the logic behind the uh, dividend allocations. Now, I'm no equity markets expert, so take everything I'm about to say here with a grain of salt. But to the best of my layman's uh, understanding, generally speaking, there's an inverse relationship, an inverse relationship between how well the fund is doing and the dividend percentage that it allocates to investors. And that's due to a couple of factors, mainly as the value of the underlying assets and therefore the value of the stock increases, investors are more comfortable with lower dividend payouts as they could profit more from the stock itself. And paying lower dividends enables the company to invest in more acquisitions, existing asset improvements, and so forth. And vice versa, when the underlying assets and the stocks are not performing as well, the funds will, in most cases, increase dividend payouts to prevent mass sell-offs of the stocks, which would then, of course, decrease the stock's value further, sort of an unvirtuous cycle there. So one shouldn't consider dividend percentage to be an indicator of how well a REIT is performing. If anything, it's actually the other way around in most cases. Um, but again, of course, as any equity investor probably knows, there are a lot more factors involved in properly in, uh, analyzing any stock, and REITs are no different in this regard. So do your homework if you're going to be active in this market. So from 20 February, uh, things change, of course. COVID starts becoming a real issue. The index plummets, losing about half of its value over the next month. It ended on 1,145 points, an average dividend of 6.8%, and the net asset value of just 0 0.69. So most assets, uh, the average asset is not performing. There are a few modest recoveries in the following months, but generally the index stayed at around 1,500 points and about 0 0.9 net asset value. So again, still not really performing well, essentially losing about 30% of the pre-COVID uh, value of, that it had altogether. Now, as could be expected during these volatile times, the REIT's diminished performance caused quite a few mergers, acquisitions, even a couple of hostile takeovers, uh, which are generally rare in Japan. But to get the full picture, we should probably look a bit more closely at the various sectors that these funds represent, uh, simply because, as with all things related to the COVID economy, there are some very major differences between various types of industries uh, that these properties and the funds cater to. So firstly, in the office space, uh, REITs specializing in grade A offices have done better. They've lost less of their value than those dealing in grades B and C. The assumption being that cashed up high end commercial tenants obviously have better cash reserves and can probably weather the storm better than their um, lower end counterparts, which could go out of business, have to relocate and so forth. Residential REITs have generally remained relatively stable. They dropped in value only slightly, which makes sense in a country where, um, like Japan, although layoffs and unemployment rates, of course, rise with crisis, employment, at least for standard full time employees, is still a bit more guaranteed than it is in most other countries. In the retail sector, um, so a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, uh, counterintuitive things there happening there. Funds dealing in high street type uh, retail stores, fancy shopping centers and so forth have naturally taken some of the biggest hits. On the other hand, supermarkets, basic needs related retail assets uh, focused REITs like department stores where people can actually buy um, hygiene goods, food products and so forth have actually gone up in value. That's most likely helped by the few rounds of panic and hoarding uh, of these products that ensued and still take place whenever infection numbers are on the rise. Logistics-related assets uh, and REITs based on them have remained quite stable. They took some minor losses but then started gaining again as online shopping began to increase a month or two into the pandemic. 
And the biggest loser, as you'd probably expect, was the hotels and hospitality sector and their associated assets and the funds that deal in those assets. Now, almost all of these JREITs have significantly reduced their issuing of new stocks because investors faced with the uncertainty of the pandemic do tend to flock to bond markets, uh, which always tends to be the case in times of crisis, particularly for those funds dealing in hospitality and retail, less so for funds dealing in residential and logistics properties. Uh, also not so bad in the office space, but with many of these funds being quite financially resilient and with good cash reserves, just due to the fact, and also due to the fact that the Bank of Japan is trying to support the market with a few buying programs of its own. And also, Japan is doing relatively well as far as COVID is concerned uh, to date. We have our ups and downs. We're now actually um, averaging about 1,000 new cases or 1,200 new cases per day, which is more than we've had in the past few months. Um, but, I mean, that all of those factors coupled with the fact that an effective vaccine does seem to be progressing steadily toward production and hopefully mass distribution on a global scale somewhere towards the middle of 2021, the general opinion among analysts tends to be that the market, or at least the larger players in the market, will survive. And although these bigger JREITs will definitely emerge bruised and battered on the other side of the pandemic, they should be able to recover their uh, losses and slowly regain their former glory, which I suppose, um, cautiously again, I'm no equity market expert, this probably means that similar to what we're seeing in the real estate, in the direct ownership real estate property market these days, um, these funds are all dealing in the same market. So now is probably an excellent time to stock up on these stocks. See what I've done there? So again, like all things related to Japan's real estate COVID stricken arena, definitely a buyer's market at the moment for anyone who's well positioned and able to make some well timed, focused purchases at a very good price. Okay, so that's it from us for today, folks. Hope this little uh, update report on the state of the JREIT market has some value for you. Always good to stay in the know, I think, even if you're not active in any particular arena, because these topics do tend to correlate and feed off each other. So we hope you enjoyed this episode. Do share it with your networks if you think they may find some value in it. And do drop us a line in the comment section. We would love to hear what you think. And especially would love to hear from your own experience if you're active in the sector or active in the real estate uh, property market in Japan generally, uh, how things have been going for you these days. And again, also feel free to contact us if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, advertising your products or services or projects that you're uh, involved in with us, as long as they're good products and services uh, and are somehow related to Japan, of course. And I'll say just one more time, do hop over to the iTunes store or Spotify if that's where you're tuning in from. Leave us a star rating or a short worded review. It means the world to us. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, from all of us here at NTI, we wish you a great day or night ahead. Yoshiku.